Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us here on Facebook for the next installment of our Opera Live broadcast series. I'm Cody Martin, Pensacola Opera's Director of Education, and I'm coming to you live from my home here in Pensacola. Now, before we begin our interview, I would like to take a moment to introduce the Pensacola Opera Relief Auction, which is a virtual auction with many great items available for you to bid on starting next week. Pensacola Opera needs your support now to keep the arts thriving in our community, and this is a great way for our community members to lend a helping hand. Your contributions through the relief auction will allow us to do what we do best once we are able to enjoy live opera and in This auction will open for bids at 7 a.m. on Tuesday, May 5th, and will run through May 12th. You can visit our auction page starting today by visiting the link that will be down below in the chat. And you can also create an account now so you'll be all set once bidding begins on Tuesday. We sincerely thank you in advance for any support you are able to offer. And now without any further ado, I'd like to introduce our guest for today. Brittany Rapizi is a fantastic wig and makeup designer with credits at Opera Delaware, Sarasota Opera, and the Brevard Music Center in addition to all of her stellar work for the Pensacola Opera main stage productions. So welcome Brittany to Opera Live, how are you? I'm well, how are you Cody? Oh, I'm fantastic. Um, so I would love to just start out by getting a little brief intro overview. Where are you from? Where have you schooled? Where do you live now? Whole story. Absolutely, so I was actually born and raised near Patterson, New Jersey. So I'm a Jersey girl at heart, and I came here actually to Pensacola to the University of West Florida for undergrad, where I studied theater, specifically musical theater. And I left here, went back home to New Jersey for a little while, floundered a bit like most of us do after undergrad, um, did some odd jobs, made most of my income actually teaching Zumba. And then in 2013, I decided to pick the studies back up and go to graduate school at the University of North Carolina School of the Arts, where I studied wig and makeup design. So since then, I've been freelancing full time. I spent a year as a wig and makeup specialist at a theme park in Virginia, and I picked up freelancing full time about three years ago and haven't stopped since until now, of course. Well, yes, fantastic. Well, speaking of that, um, how are you doing right now? What is what is the effect of the current crisis been on you and your art? you know, your art and everything? Uh, I mean, first and foremost, I'm healthy. My husband's healthy. My family's healthy. Um, but on the business end of things, it's really hard. It's not great right now. Um, I lost, just like everyone else, I lost a lot of contracts. We lost $21,000 in business in the drop of a hat. And I'm happy to stay home to keep everybody safe, but I'm excited to get back to work as soon as possible. Um, I I just really miss art. I miss working with you guys. I miss working with my families at Opera Delaware. Uh, I was going to be at Opera on the James this year. It was going to be a really exciting season. And the spring and into summer season is where most of us make a lot of our income to settle a little nest egg for, you know, those down times in business. And a lot of us are, a lot of us are suffering right now. I hear you on wanting to get back to the art and to work. Um, uh, this is, you know, this has been very interesting though for me to get to, you know, chat with people like you and for people to get to know what it's like for artists right now, because I'm sure a lot of people are kind of unaware of just how big of an impact it has had on all of us. Um, but yeah, just like, just like you said, I'm so excited to get back into the theater. I feel like um, it's really weird for our industry specifically because when everything does eventually become safe again and people are ready to go out and attack the world and be back in business, most places their doors will open and it'll be back to business as normal. But for us, when the shows get canceled or the shows get postponed, they're just, they're gone, they're done. And it's really hard to try to re-coordinate getting those shows back together getting those months of work that we lost back. And, you know, it's going to be a hard struggle to get back there, but I can't wait. For sure. I'm sure, I'm sure it will get back though. Um, we're all just kind of figuring out when and how it's going to get back. 
<laughs> um, let's go back a little bit. So talk about how you got interested in the arts and how you fell into the wig and makeup thing. Um, it's kind of an interesting, it's an interesting career choice that I'm sure not a lot of people know how you get into that. It is. And if you would have asked me in high school if this is what I would be doing, I would have told you no. I would have been on Broadway starring in a show, but this is what I love to do. And I was in arts all my life. I grew up a dancer and discovered theater and musical theater when I was in middle school. And all through high school, I was heavily involved in the theater department at Passaic Valley High School in Little Falls, New Jersey. And I came here to UWF for theater and I focused in musical theater. And while I was here, with the help of Glenn Breed, our costume designer, I fell into doing hair and makeup. We were doing a production of Guys and Dolls and the wigs that we ordered were not great. So I volunteered to fix them as best as I could and turns out I was pretty okay at it. So I spent that following summer as my first year at the Brevard Music Center. So that was summer 2008. I was an intern at the Brevard Music Center and I've been there as a designer for seven seasons since, but that just kind of took off from there. I worked under a great designer, learned a lot and that took me into the world of wigs. That's fantastic. Um, so let's talk kind of about the process. When when you get you get you know hired to do a show, what is the first thing that you do, and how do you kind of decide what everything should look like and how it's going to look like that? How do you do all of that? The first thing I do is try to get my hands on the libretto, take a read through it if I don't know the show, and then my next call is to the director and to the other designers because it's not just about the wigs, it's not just about the costumes or the scenery, we all have to tell the same story. So we make sure we're in the same time period, we're in the same palette, we're in the same world, so that all of our characters live together in the same place. So my first calls are to those people, we come up with some ideas and some designs. If we're looking to do something weird and fantastical, I'm always on board for that, but it's making sure we're doing it all the same way. And from there, it's renderings if I need to, but mainly it's getting my hands on our performers and onto the wigs and transforming them into what we need for the show. So now another thing that people might not really realize is that you actually create wigs by hand. Like, tell us how that works. How do you do that? It seems like magic to me. I have no idea how you would even create a wig. It's a lot of work. It's very tedious work, but wig makers love what they do. It's, we make them by hand as much as we can. And I'll, I'll show you one in a second, but we literally tie hair one at a time into lace that's the color, the color of skin tone. So it's, it's why the glasses are on. It's very tedious work. You have to <laughs> have really good eyes, but there is a hundred ways to make a wig. There's no right way. There's no wrong way. Every wig maker and designer has their own way of doing things. And I've gotten into the rhythm and the flow of how I like to build mine, but sometimes we don't have something in the wig stock that fits a performer or that works for a character. So we have to pull something out of nowhere, like actually uh, what I did for Don Giovanni, Hide. I've never worked with Hide before. He happens to have a slightly larger head. So I had to build a wig for two days. Wow, yeah. For the character, but I can show you. Um, yeah, that'd be great. I don't know how well we will be able to see this on camera, but this is a lace front wig and this was actually made for my stock. And if you can see really closely, all those hairs are tied in one at a time. Very <laughs> beautiful baby. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That's really great. I actually have a picture of um, Don Giovanni, which we just did this past season. Let me get this pulled up if I can get the technology to work. There we go. So there's Sarah Tucker, who was our Donna, and David Blaylock is there behind her, our Donut Tavio. Do you want to talk about these looks a little bit or what you were thinking about for these? Uh, so her wig was actually one of my favorites in the show. It, The blonde was perfect for her character. Those waves were nice and crisp, and it went really well with her costumes, especially the paper ones, because the, the flow of those waves really matched up with the flow of her costumes and getting her into this and putting the makeup and the wig on her and watching her transform into the character was just really awesome for me. 
Yeah, I, and that whole show was in an art deco aesthetic. So did that have any effect on how you designed the wigs or the makeup? Absolutely. So we look at the time periods of art deco. So we, for that show, sort of ranged 20s, 30s, 40s, all in that art deco period. But the art deco period was a little over the top, very crisp lines, harsh juxtaposition of colors. And that's what I tried to do with a lot of the hair, especially those waves in her wig. And uh, for the commendatory's wig, he had a dark, but with those really harsh streaks and just trying to make it fit with the clothes and with the scenery. Yeah. Now, speaking of another very specific project, um, you we had last season we did Florencia in the Amazon and we had this very specific look for um, Luis Orozco who sang Rio Lobo. Let's talk a little bit about this because I know, did you build this wig? I did. So that was yeah. another one where we had a conversation with the director. Um, I had a conversation with John about what he wanted and he told me to go for it. And when I asked him the color palette, he told me the blues and the greens. I looked at the pictures from the show that was done previously and decided to make my own take on it. And I asked him if he would be okay with a blue and green wig and he absolutely was on board. So I spent a few days building that blue and green wig, which is one of my favorites in my wig stock <laughs> and created a whole look around the aesthetic of the costume and the hair and bringing the whole body into it. This was a really collaborative look. Now, speaking of the blue, I mean, I, we can tell in this picture that he his whole body was painted <laughs> blue. So how do you, I know it's a task and I know you didn't personally do any of the painting, but I'm sure you worked with how it was gonna happen and what? how do you paint a whole body? Uh, very quickly and very carefully. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, I was not here for this production. This one I designed from afar and sent everything here for my crew to handle. And they did a phenomenal job. And I sent renderings of what the body painting should look like. And what we actually did was pre-paint his body from the neck down during the pre-show time. So two hours before the show even started, he was painted blue from the neck down. And what we used was a water-based paint so that when that character was over, when he needed to change again, he could just take a quick shower and all that blue paint would come off. So I'm assuming we stained a bathroom at the Sanger Theater, but no one's yelled at me. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't heard anything about it, so I think we're good. <laughs> um, so in this whole process, do you have a favorite part, um, most fulfilling, or what, what do you like doing the most from beginning to end? I think it's actually doing it from beginning to end is my favorite thing. Um, everyone works a little bit differently and there's different ways to be a wig and makeup designer. Working with the small regional companies like Pensacola Opera and Delaware, I get the privilege of doing every step. So I build the wigs, I style the wigs, I apply them, I apply the makeup, I design it. Whereas the bigger companies, you might be doing just one of those jobs. And it's a privilege for me to be able to do all of those steps and see my design truly from beginning to end. So being able to sit out in the house on opening night and just see the whole realization come together and to see all the work is really special. Yeah. So talk about, um, obviously during tech week, when you're, when you're actually working the show that you've designed, it's, it's a hectic schedule for you. You wanna talk a little bit about what your days look like during, like, let's say the day of a dress rehearsal, what would your day look like? So day of the dress rehearsal starts pretty early. I usually am the one begging to get into the theater as early as possible. Uh, so as soon as I can get into the theater, I'm in there. I'm finishing up styles on wigs, touching anything up that might have gotten messed up in the rehearsal the night before, cleaning all my makeup brushes, setting up makeup, dishing out makeup for the chorus members, making sure my crew is all set. And then we start our makeup two hours before the curtain rises. So at two hours beforehand, my crew and I are applying makeup, we're putting wigs on people, we're prepping their hair, we're styling their hair if we need to, making sure everyone in the chorus looks the way they're supposed to. And then it's usually a mad dash to the finish line before that curtain goes up. So we're in really early and we're usually there the latest because once that curtain comes down, we still have to get everyone out of their wigs, out of their makeup, clean up our stuff and then, and then get out. 
Oh yeah. <laughs> um, so how do you kind of, obviously you, you want to have a kind of basic plan for each person of how they're going to look. Mm -hmm. Is there a way that you notate that or is it just kind of remembering what you did the night before? Honestly, it's a little bit of both. If we have a lot of time and resources, I love to be able to draw a makeup map for each character, especially if I'm working with a crew, I can hand them off a makeup map. They can follow that and they know exactly what the character should look like. Sometimes we're on the fly. Sometimes it's just, this is what I did last night, but I know I have to make the makeup a little bit stronger so that it reads from the audience and just working through there. <laughs> yeah. Now that's an interesting phrase that people might not really understand what it means for something to read from the audience. So tell us about that. So for example, my makeup right now, the makeup that I put on today for the first time in 40 days, I, uh, this would not read well from the theater. When you're on stage, the lights are really bright, they're really harsh, and they tend to make everyone look washed out. And because we have lights coming from different directions, it tends to actually make facial features disappear. Noses disappear, jaw lines disappear. So we paint makeup really heavy. And I say paint because we're painting. It's like a canvas. We're trying to do the highlights, the shadows, really define everything on the face so that that audience member in the last row sees the same thing as the audience member in the first row. Wow. Yeah. And that's something you wouldn't even think about in the audience because when you're out there, everything looks so normal. But um, I know at Pensacola, there's usually not an opportunity, but at some companies, they have the people, the actors come out and kind of greet audience members. And it's always fun to watch the audience members' reaction when they see what they look like up close because it's so different from how it looks on stage. <laughs> they see themselves in the mirror. Sometimes they think they look a little crazy and they do. Up close, they look very crazy, but on stage, it's giving us exactly what we want for that character. Yeah. Great. Well, I think we were going to do some sort of little live demonstration. Do you want to tell us what you're going to do for that? Yes. So I have a wonderful live-in model, my husband. He's been my model through all of grad school, and he's a very lucky man. But I decided I wanted to see what the uh, maybe the end of this isolation would look like and turn him into a crazy old man. Fantastic. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> All right, everyone. Let me introduce you to my husband. Husband. <laughs> husband. Gone. Husband. Sorry. There's <laughs> everyone, this is my husband, Al. Hello. So we're going to take this beautiful face and I'm going to pretend that maybe we have a quick change going on for a show and I only have five minutes to turn him into a crazy old man. How does that sound? Let's do it. I love that. Awesome. So he has this beautiful thick black beard and if we're going to turn him into an old man, we're just going to make that go away. <laughs> and I'm using an alcohol-based makeup right now, so that if he were to sweat like crazy, it actually wouldn't go anywhere. Normal makeup is affected by water, so if he were to get really sweaty, it would just leak right off of his face. And I know nobody sweats on stage, right? So that's <laughs> not a concern. <laughs> never, never. Uh, no, sweating on stage is always a big concern of ours, especially with some of our classic operas because the costumes are always multiple pieces. They're very heavy. And our period shows they have multiple layers and they start sweating immediately as soon as they put them on. Oh yeah. So, so we actually, we have, we have a makeup related question, which is, is it harder to make someone younger or older? Mary Hallway asks. Mary, it is absolutely harder to make someone younger. It is. <laughs> you can turn anyone older by adding what I'm doing right now, some creases and shadows, adding some gray. But to make someone look younger, we have to take all of those things that are on their face away. <laughs> That's where lighting actually helps us a whole lot. <laughs> if you were able to make somebody look younger, I bet you would have a lot of business. I would have an absolute <laughs> lot of business. <laughs> like I. I tell my performers all the time, I am a makeup artist, not a miracle worker. Yes. 
So what I'm doing to Al right now is I'm giving him some wrinkles and deepening his eyes a little bit to really make him look like maybe this uh, virus has taken a toll on how long he's been in the house and he's a little tired. Maybe he's been stuck with his wife too long. <laughs> Never. So is this stuff that you're doing now, are you, you said this is probably something more, more than you would need to see up close. Are you doing stuff for the stage right now? I am. I'm painting as heavy as I can in a short period of time. When we're working on film or television, anywhere that would be really up close, we would not paint this heavy because all the audience would see are makeup lines. Right. What we want the audience to see in the theater are those big, deep shadows that give the appearance of being older without going into the fine details of wrinkles and lines. We want that audience member to immediately look at him and go, oh, he's old. <laughs> exactly. Well, it looks like we're getting there. <laughs> we're getting there right? And my, yeah. my favorite part of painting a face is the eyebrows. Always the eyebrows. The eyebrows are what give people character. Mm -hmm. I want to make him maybe a crazy, drunk old man. He's not tweezing his eyebrows, right? <laughs> They're going to be a little crazy. Really I, loved, I loved what you did with um, Corey McKern's eyebrows in Don Giovanni. Those were some special eyebrows. Those were some special eyebrows. Those <laughs> eyebrows were to make him look as sleazy as humanly possible. And I think we did the job. Corey is not sleazy, but we made him look. <laughs> um, Donna asks, are different types of skin types such as oily or dry more of a problem? I don't, I wouldn't say any of them are more of a problem. I think everyone's face is different. Um, that gives us different challenges to work on and a more oily face won't hold makeup as well. So we have to make sure that they are prepped and primed so that the makeup doesn't slide all over their face. Drier skin, we have to do the opposite. Moisturize it to make sure it really sinks in. Yeah. All right, all right. Ready? So now we're getting some hair. So this is actually a pretty close representation for what I would do for a character like Frosh from Deflator Mouse. Mm -hmm. You know, our drunk jailer, making him look a little crazy. As a matter of fact, this wig was worn by Dean Anthony as Frosh. <laughs> in our production this summer at Brevard Music Center. Oh, fantastic. So right now I'm just pinning the wig on him. If he were to go on stage and do some cartwheels and somersaults, it wouldn't fall off. Yeah, that's probably pretty important, especially for a role like that, if they're gonna be jumping around or running around. All right. So that's our little five minute old man quick change. Wow. I'm going to applaud you because I, I know people are applauding at home, so I'm going to applaud from here. <laughs> and this is my future. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. All right, I have one more question I want to make sure we get to, um, which was Carrie asked, what was your favorite production that you got to be involved with? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, there's something about each show that I do that I love. There's always fun. There's always something unique to do. I was very fortunate to be a part of New York City Opera's production of Stonewall last summer. And that was just a very special production to be a part of. It was maybe the most diverse cast I've ever worked with. It was important subject matter. It was beautifully done. And it's just something I'm really proud to have been a part of. Um, there are shows that are fun and funky that I've loved doing. We did Scalia Ginsburg at Opera Delaware last year, which we had so much fun with. Okay. Um, our Don Giovanni was a blast. There's just, it's really hard to pinpoint your favorite show. <laughs> you know, as, as many of us say in the business, our favorite show is the show that we're working on right now. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, Corey McKern says, thanks for saying I'm not sleazy. Now, Corey was our Don Giovanni this year, and as Brittany was just saying, she tried to make him as sleazy looking as possible. 
<laughs> um, Carrie also asked, what did you use to pin the hair? So I have a wide array of pins. In fact, I will be happy to show you one of my many toolboxes here. And everything in here has its own purpose. So what I just used to pin on him are these big little mamas right here. They slide into the lace of the wig really nicely without causing damage. And they hold really well. So every wig is different. Every person it's going on is different. So there's no one way to do it. We just use what's right for that person in that wig. Wow. That's incredible. So you've got lots of uh, special tools of the trade, I'm sure. Absolutely. I actually, um, because of all the isolation and everything going on with the virus, I just had to move out of my work studio. For the last two years, I've been renting a studio space here in town that I can work out of. And I've, I've lost work just like everybody else. So I've had to move all of my stuff out of that studio and into a storage unit. And I have a lot of stuff. I didn't realize how much stuff that was until I started boxing it up. And I've moved here into our guest bedroom at the house, trying to work out of here. And I fit maybe 15% of it in this room. And the rest is in a big old storage unit. <laughs> Good for you. I know we're all having to adapt like that right now. Um, one more question that we have is from Fenlin, who asks, who's your favorite director? You know, we I have Face. This one because I've worked with some really great directors, but it would have to be Fenlin Lamb because she asked the question. Of course, yeah. <laughs> but I, Fenlin is fantastic to work with. She's open to any sort of ideas that you might have. She's always willing to listen, and I'm lucky to work with the people I have. Yes, of course. She also asked, How many wigs are in your stock? That's a good question. As of right now, you see a, a few of them behind me, but as of right now, there are just over 135 wigs in my stock at my last <coughs> count. Ooh, that was my dog. <laughs> so as of right now, there's 135 wigs in my stock uh, and continuing to build. So with each show that I do, I build a few more wigs and they get added to the stock. Oh, he's got something he's saying over there. <laughs> Um, great. Well, I think we're about out of time for today. Do you have any thoughts to people who are wondering, you know, maybe what they can do to help artists or how they can support companies and freelance artists during this time? Absolutely. So every company I work for has handled this whole pandemic differently. And I don't think anyone has necessarily done, a, done anything wrong or done anything right, but everyone's handled it differently and done what they've done for the best of their company. They're trying to keep their company healthy and strong and thriving so that we can come back and continue working. So if you have the means and if you have the opportunity, please donate to your local arts organizations, your local opera and theater companies, help them help us. Uh, not every company has been as giving as Pensacola as far as paying what they could of our contracts. And it's because they need their companies to stay alive for the future. If me taking a cut of my pay right now means that I have jobs for the next 10 years because the company is still alive. That's a sacrifice I'm willing to make. It is, it's hard. Uh, this is the time where I usually make a good deal of my money to put in my nest egg and, and live off of for the next couple of months. And we don't have that right now. We're struggling and artists live their work. We live, we eat, we breathe what we do. And not only are we mourning financially, we're mourning our work and we're mourning our friends and the art that we work. And it's, if you can, if you're one of the lucky people that are still working, you had tickets and the shows are no longer happening. If you can donate anything, please do. Please support your local art companies and do what you can. We all are. Great. Awesome. Well, thank you for joining me today. Um, this has been very enlightening, even for me. I, you know, there's so many things you don't even think about for these when you're just in the audience. Or even if you're working in the production, I'm not a, a makeup person, so I never thought about these things. So um, thank you so much for joining us. I hope you stay well and stay safe, um, and we will see you soon. Thanks, Cody. Everyone stay safe and healthy. All right, thanks. 
Thank you all for joining us as well for our chat today. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the broadcast, we are starting an online auction starting next week, the Pensacola Opera Relief Fund, and that link is down in the chat. So if you'd like to check that out, bidding will open up on Tuesday morning. Um, and thank you all for your continued support and uh, patronage of Pensacola Opera, and we hope to see you again soon.